This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University. And today I want to talk about Warren Buffett in a light that you may not have seen him portrayed before. I'm calling him the vampire from Omaha. And you may be asking yourself, could this sweet old man really be a financial vampire? When I see this kind of picture, what I actually see is this, if I look really, really closely. So I think historians are going to look back on Warren Buffett as the quintessential example of peak fiat privilege. And I'm going to explain in a minute what that means. You could hear Warren Buffett almost saying in a very deep level of his soul, my daddy was a senator and I lived to profit from government bailouts and fiat food, rent seeking and central bank money printing. Of course, he never explains it in these terms, but this is in fact what he has done and how he has lived and how he has acquired so much money. Fiat money, for those of you new to the channel, it's just unlimited money, un unlimited paper money printed up by a government. And it contrasts with sound money like gold or Bitcoin, much harder forms of money that can't just be easily printed up. The fiat era really started in 1971 when Nixon suspended the convertibility of the US dollar back into physical gold. You might also trace it back to the founding of the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which is a central bank in the US. I believe it was in 19. 13. So this is the context for when I call it peak fiat privilege. Buffett got rich in a time of declining interest rates and peak fiatism, both in the financial markets and in the culture and in the food, as we're going to see. So I like to call him instead of calling Warren, Buff Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, I like to call him Warren Muppet and Charlie Muppet. We can see them here. They do look very similar to these guys, obviously. Buffett made his fame and fortune with Berkshire Hathaway, which he converted from an old textile company to this multinational conglomerate holding company. And then uh, Charlie Munger came along, I believe, in the 70s. They became good friends and he got a piece of the company. So they're really, they're really the, uh, the Muppet twins and they've been that way for a while. They made most of their money, as I said, from banks, insurance companies, and junk food companies. Now, the thing about fiat food, modern American food, addictive, highly processed, too much sugar, too much salt, too much seed oils, which clearly cause a lot of health problems. If you're, if you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to hit the like and subscribe buttons to help support the channel. Buffett is famous for showing himself eating really disgusting food. That's It's the kind of food I grew up on, to be honest, but it's definitely not good for you. And uh, it's actually a testament to the quality of his genetic makeup that he's lived into his 90s eating like this. He's famous for saying that he drinks five cans of Coke a day. And before that, he drank Pepsi every day. If you look at what Berkshire Hathaway is in invested in, some of their biggest holdings, obviously Kraft Heinz, which, which was a merger between Kraft and Heinz, still on the Berkshire balance sheet. And this is a list of, as I said, this is basically what I grew up eating, unfortunately, in the 70s. It's probably a list of things and brands that you should avoid for the most part. But this is what Buffett loves uh, investing in. And of course, the, the, the greatest example of this was his investment in Coca-Cola in the late 80s. And he really did invest in what he was what he was consuming, but Coke has obviously not been good for the global obesity epidemic. It's not been good for diabetes. We can see here, uh, this is a story I believe about Mexico and how you can't get any water anywhere, but you can get Coke everywhere and everyone has diabetes. You can see a lot of stories, similar stories coming out of India as well, not just damage to human beings and their, uh, their pancreases, but also damage to the greater environment. Next, I want to turn to Warren Muppet's love of big banks. He's probably the only person in America who loves the big banks besides, of course, the bankers themselves. And I'm talking about commercial banks and investment banks like Goldman Sachs, for example. Now, what's wrong with the banks? Rent-seeking behavior, no competition. And up until Bitcoin, you're forced to deal with them whether you liked it or not. The banks, especially U.S. banks, are quite awful due to very limited competition, due to consolidation and merger and acquisition, M&A activity, always terrible customer service rivaled only by the U.S. Post Office. And the other, the, the biggest problem with the banks, of course, is they privatize the profits and they socialize the losses. And this is what we saw in the 2008, 2009 great financial crisis. Up until that point, the bankers were getting huge bonuses and good times, which is fine if you're actually producing a product. They don't really produce a product. And then when the times turn bad and they've taken too much risk on their balance sheets and they blow up and are insolvent, then these banks get government bailouts. And of course, no one ever goes to jail. So this is the problem with rent-seeking corporations 
that have this special too big to fail put behind them. I'm not going to go into huge detail, but I'll link to a couple articles below where we can see how much of a bailout Warren Buffett got personally through his holdings in Berkshire Hathaway. This is a good article called Buffett's Betrayal, how Warren Buffett gained from the bank bailout. And this article shows that Berkshire Hathaway and firms with inside of it, all his positions, his stock positions in big US banks received $95 billion in taxpayer dollars as part of the TARP uh, Troubled Asset Relief Program. So this is a guy who's really lived off of the government. In addition to that, all these awful stories about his mobile home empire. I believe this is Clayton Holmes and um, how he really takes advantage of, of the working class. And, the, and this, this would be bad enough in itself, but he tries to wear this angelic aura and pretend he's this saint, he's, he, he's this Santa Claus from Omaha. That's really the, the disgusting thing about it when you think of where he has made his money. The other really weird thing, especially as an old man, he talks a lot about sex, which of course is a, an interesting metaphor that gets people's attentions. But when someone's in their 70s and 80s and 90s and they keep talking about it, I personally find that just a little a little weird because that's not normally a huge part of uh, life for 70, 80, 90 year olds. But then when you think about the company he keeps, uh, guys like this who've had problems with guys like this, it sort of makes sense that he's he's a bit of a creep. And um, I think uh, if you read his biography, you'll see how uh, how he's treated various various family members, which I'm not going to go into here. Finally, I want to talk about one of one of the investing principles that he's famous for and show you how it's actually not as good as he has dressed it up to seem. In fact, it's quite sinister. So there's this idea of the moat and investing in companies that have a moat. A moat is just Buffett's metaphor for a sustainable competitive advantage. It's like having a moat around your castle, which makes it harder for people to attack your castle. In the case of the banks that Buffett has invested in, this moat is not any technological advantage. It's not any uh, anything being intelligent. It's actually just lots of lobbying, having a government charter and lots of government regulation, which creates huge regulatory barriers that stop new entrants. So this is a very sinister kind of moat. This is a rent-seeking moat. And when you think about it, these kind of moats, they're actually the opposite of progress. They try to retard uh, progress and not have the world move forward. So you're still stuck with your bank that operates in the same way it did in the 1970s. It's very slow and, um, and it's very bad customer service. This is one reason, of course, that Buffett has been so anti-tech his whole life. He railed against the internet stocks as greater full investments, much as he calls a Bitcoin a greater full investment now. He railed against the internet stocks in 99 and 2000. And then it took him about 15 or 20 years. He finally figured out that a lot of these were really good businesses. Apple, he bought for the first time in 2000, in 2016, and he bought Amazon in 2019, very close to the end of the run. So he's very, he's not someone you want to rely on for forward-looking tech investments. This makes sense. When I'm in my 70s, 80s, and 90s, I will not have my finger on the pulse of tech either. Uh, he wants the government enforce monopolies. He wants to invest in moat companies, government enforced monopolies, where he can just sit back and rent seek. And so this is, of course, uh, I think it's good context for understanding why this guy who has profited his whole life from central bank money printers, government bailouts, bailouts, and peak fiat privilege, this guy doesn't like Bitcoin. Color me shocked. This is, of course, what we would expect. And I love this meme, which I've shown many times before, Buffett saying Bitcoin is rat poison. And then we get to see who the rats are here that it is hurting. Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, City. HSBC, etc. And here's another version of the meme. Here's the vampire version of it, which I thought was fit to end on. Vampire running from sunlight, Superman, Superman running from kryptonite, and bankers and Buffett and Munger running away from Bitcoin and really misrepresenting it whenever they talk to the media as well. So I think this is the light in which we have to understand Buffett. And the great irony is he holds himself out as this very transparent, very honest, very ethical human being. But you have to ignore what he says and look at what he does, what he is actually invested in and what he uh, has chosen to vote with his money for. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. I want to wish all of you a happy Martin Luther King Day, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.